Okay, can we get a roll call, please? Dr. Baby? Present. Dr. Baby is present. Ms. Bofi? I'm here. Ms. Bofi is present. Ms. Bradford? Ms. Bradford is not present. Mr. Garvey? Here. Mr. Garvey is present. <clears throat> Mr. Gio? Mr. Gio is not present. Ms. Hill? Present. Ms. Hill is present. Mr. Lee? Mr. Lee is not present. Ms. Dr. Moranti? Present. Dr. Moranti is present. Ms. Orange Jones? Ms. Orange Jones is present. Yes, I'm Ms. present. I'm sorry. Mr. Romer? Mr. Romer is not present. Ms. Smith? Present. Ms. Smith is present. You have a quorum. Okay, can we have our first item, please? First item is on page one, item 2.1. Consideration of a report on types 2, 4, and 5 charter contracts and requests for amendments. And the department recommendation is to approve. Can we get a motion to approve, please? Motion. Ms. Ms. Jones, thank you. Can we get a second? Ms. Moranti? Do we have any questions from Bessie members about this item? Hearing none, we have some speakers. It's not. Which one are we? Oh. Two, uh, 2.1. You have speakers, uh, Mr. Garvey? Yes, ma'am. Okay, can we have Mr. Craig Jackson come down? And Mr. Clovis Christman? Christman? And Stephen Collins, please. Just let me know when you're ready. We are ready. Okay. Um, I'm here on behalf of Delta Charter School, Faraday, Louisiana, Concordia Parish. What we're asking for, we currently have 322 children in our school. Uh, this is our first year of operation. We know that we don't have uh, solid data yet as far as test scores, but what we do have data on is our local school, which is the reason that Bessie did grant us a charter school, uh, they perform at, they have two D's, two F's, a D minus and a D is their grade so far. That's their data. This is what we call our real data. This is our enrollment figures or our enrollment applications for this year, which we only have 15 spots available under our current contract. And so what we're asking for is if we could go for 322 children, up to 422 children to at least let about half of these children and parents that are wanting a different choice in. Now, I do know that there's concerns about our minority numbers. Uh, it's a very hard uphill battle to overcome perception. That's one reason we brought Mr. Collins. He's a teacher on our staff. He also helped in our minority recruiting. And I do want to say that the first year, we literally only had 11% African American enrollment when we ran our open enrollment. So we ran another open enrollment. When it was all said and done, we had literally 11%. Once we opened the doors, we got up to about 14%. Uh, the reason why is perception. And I'm gonna let Mr. Collins tell y'all. African-American families were told in our community that if their child went to our school, we would count them in October, kick them out, keep the money, and that was that. That sounds foolish, it sounds ridiculous, but, but that's the truth. Uh, this year in this enrollment, 30% of our applicants are African American. Now that's, that's a big increase from 11%. I'd also like to say that our local school board likes to, to, to let y'all know that, hey, we're 50-50 we're as a school, as a, as a local district. Well, that's wonderful, but you ought to ask them about that 700 and something kids in Monterey in that school district. They're like 99% white. Or the however many children they have in Faraday, which is 99% black. So what I'm saying is we are literally the second most diverse school in our parish and by far the first school that's ever been diverse in Faraday. Because whenever they did the, the civil, the, the suit back in the 60s, a private school was formed. Faraday went to a complete minority school system, 
And so we are the first school that does absolutely have diversity. And we're going to continue to grow that diversity. And we're working hard on it. And it's not going to happen overnight. But we have a lot of people that want different choices. And that's why I'm here. That's why I do this. We don't get paid to be on our board. I, I, I do this because I believe in the charter movement. I believe y'all believe in it. And we won't, I mean, these people won't send their kid to our school. And, and all we can say is we've got 15 spots. And, and we, we just want 100 spots. You know, we're not asking to give us 300 or 400. We want to add a junior class of 20 students and fill in the rest of the gaps with, with additional students, you know, to fill up our grades. Uh, that's, that's really why I'm here. Uh, I, I know it's difficult to ask in year one, but con considering our competition, and, and this, is, this is data. You know, these people are already going to school, and they want to come to our school. You know, that, that's real data. And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Chrisman. If y'all have any questions, I'd love to answer anything. Okay. Before you turn it over, I did have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that the minority applicants went up from 11% up to 30%. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you did anything to reach out to that community that caused that increase, and if not, are you going to do anything to reach out to that community? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Absolutely. What we, what we did to begin with and we continue to do is we reached out in places where African Americans frequent in our area. We're a small rural area. They frequent at a place called Doty Road Convention Center. They frequent at the 4th Street Gym. They frequent at the libraries. Uh, the Head Start School is pretty much, I believe, just about all African American. We put applications in every backpack there. We advertise in not only our paper, but every local paper, on the radios, uh, different stations that reach different uh, segments of our community. But the biggest obstacle, and it, and it sounds, it sounds like bull, for lack of a better word, when it comes from somebody like me, saying that. The African American community was toe to fill, but maybe from somebody like Mr. Collins, it, it'll be more real because he he he's, he sees this. He still hears from parents today as he was helping us recruit, and even as a teacher, he was told things by his supervisor or superintendent that simply was not true. Uh, he basically left his school to come teach at ours, and. He was told that he didn't have any options to return back to that school system, not even on a leave of absence. So there's a lot of misconception, a lot of things that are not on the level being told in our area, and we're overcoming them. But now that we're open, people see that we're transparent, we're real, we're, we don't discriminate. Uh, they're coming now. And it, it, it's going to take Mr. time, but... Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Order. No, this is I'm sorry. Can you, can you tell me where we are? We are yeah. 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 Page one, um, the what? item is Item 2.1. For, for charter amendments. Wait. Item. And, and this would be a charter amendment, so... Uh, uh, is it on... Is this it on is this on the Is this... Could, could this, I, could I, this is not on I, the I might agenda, help. I don't I'm believe. I don't, I'm this school is not on the agenda, but charter amendments are on the agenda and what? I raised this question earlier uh, with Bessie staff and we decided that it was close enough to oh. the agenda item to be relevant. Are you so are we adding it to our agenda? <laughs> I, I don't understand what we're addressing. Uh, if I may, uh, my apologies, uh, and I was, I was outside when we started this. Th this uh, school has submitted a request for an uh, amendment. It has not been brought to you uh, because there has been conflicting information coming from a variety of parties. Uh, thus, they have one submitted to the department. We have not brought you a recommendation because, frankly, we don't feel like we have the knowledge. And so they have volunteered to come and speak today to provide information on their perspective. There may be others who wish to comment on it, but it is an open item to consider charter amendments. And one of them, you, you have a recommendation on this one happens to exist. You just have no recommendation. My apologies for not clarifying that earlier. Mr. Superintendent. That, that's okay. It's partly my fault for trying to uh, start as quickly Delta, as we could. Uh, do they represent a charter school? Delta. They do, Delta. They represent Delta Charter School in Fairdale. Yes, sir. Delta yes. Charter School, Concordia Parish, Fairdale, Louisiana. Mr. Superintendent, maybe you help to give a little background. It was approved last year. Yes, sir. This, this charter school was approved actually two years ago. It started last year. And... Uh, uh, they have asked for uh, an additional grade level ahead of schedule. And uh, in receiving some of the, the data 
t typically in the past we've granted those kinds of requests because of demand of parents, and that's certainly been their case here today. Uh, I'll tell you, um, uh, this is a small community, which is relatively new for us with charter schools. Not entirely, but relatively new. And secondly, there are some differences in the, it's a very, uh, uh, knowing the community the little that I do, it is a uh, community of some diversity and, and you know, difficult patterns to, to kind of fit within. And so we noticed that in some of the data, we want to make sure we're corresponding with the law. And the law requires that the percentage of students that are in charter schools be proportionate to the percentage of schools in traditional schools who are in low-income conditions, for example. So we looked at their data, and we, we saw some conflicting reports. We got a lot of emails from a wide variety of people, looked at their race and socioeconomic data, and really just wanted them to come and tell their story. So we're not voting on anything. That's we, correct. We're That's just correct. listening to them. That's correct. correct. And, and based on the information, we may choose to bring you a recommendation on this matter at a later time. Uh, but I, again, apologies for not being clear. One, one thing that Mr. concerns Lee. me a little bit, I think the superintendent was here earlier. Here. He put in a card to speak oh, on this he item. Here? He's here. So he's, he's here. He's here. Oh, okay. I'm just surprised that I, item that's not on the agenda. Ms. Hill? I just, I just my concern, because um, number one is no offense to this charter group, but from a Bessie member and from staff and the superintendent, the lack of communication because you guys are not on the agenda. We were not aware that you were coming today. However, with that being said, um, I know we're just here to listen to your concerns in regards to um, making a recommendation to want to increase a great level and the department did not recommend. So to my understanding, when the department does not recommend the charter to us, it's like a denial. So with, what, so with that being said, and my concern for Superintendent White, we have had other charters that come forward, and I'm not going to call no charter's name, and it, which, which, it, which in the same situation as you guys, and their recommendation has just been ignored. So I'm just trying to make sure that we are doing what's right and best interest for all groups. Can, can I address that question because I think it's relevant? Please. We were on the last. Agreed. We were on the last agenda in January that y'all had with a re recommendation. Uh, something happened between the time that we were all all on the go. Uh, that was for a recommendation to go all the way to the twelfth grade. Uh, we came to the meeting. We were asked to to back out of the meeting because Superintendent White. And then we're concerned about some of our minority numbers and just wanted some clarification on them, which we, we were ready to do that day. So we were on the last agenda. And we're just, we're just some, sometimes, I hate to use the word politics, but sometimes there, there's just some politics involved. And I'm just, I'm not a politician. I'm, I'm trying to help families. I'm trying to help kids. I'm trying to help a community. And I, I knew when I didn't get on that, when, when we took ourselves off that agenda, me and Mr. Crispin said, man, you know, we did what we thought was right because the department said, you mind taking yourself off? We want to make sure some things are clear and you'll be on the March agenda. We're not on the March agenda, but we're still here because I've got to fight for this because this is what I do now. Uh, I guess I'm crazy, but this is what uh, my calling is for my community. So we were once on the agenda with an approval or with a recommendation. That was the January agenda, and we literally got pulled off at 30 minutes before we would have been. Well, I'll, I'll take responsibility for that, Mr. Jackson, and, okay. and let me tell you why. Um, while it's not the exclusive purpose of charter schools, we as a state have pursued a charter school strategy that is targeted toward the highest need students. Not, not exclusively, but for the most part, that's been the way we've done. We've said where there are, are low-income students that are not being provided a, the education that they deserve, let's provide an alternative. And so when we charter schools, we have that mission in mind, and the law uh, corresponds with that. The law you know, backs us up and says charter schools have to serve their, that equal share. And so I think there are two reasons. Number one, we were seeing all kinds of data flying back and forth, and I just needed some clarity. Yes, sir. But secondly, it's very hard to sitting here in Baton Rouge to understand the community dynamics. And I felt like even when I dug into the race data, I couldn't fully understand why this was happening. And let me explain why. 
Um, this is a uh, parish that is roughly proportionally African American and white. However, it's the population in Vidalia is a very different one from the population in Faraday and the public schools I'm talking about. So it was hard for me as an outsider, again, not a member of your community, but knowing that our mission was to serve the most disadvantaged students, to understand why only 15% of the kids in your school were black. And again, I'm an outsider to your community, but there are a lot of concerns about the perception of charter schools, what you're exactly doing, and frankly, just history that that raises a red flag for. And it's very hard for me to say, yes, you can break beyond your contract, and I'm going to bring that to this board without an explanation of that. And I can't leave this session today in good conscience and come back to this board with a recommendation, no matter the parents demanding it, without a sense of why that happened and without a sense of how to make it better. Because the fact of it is that we do charter with the objective of first serving the most disadvantaged. And that, that would be my question to you. Yeah, and that's fair, and I appreciate let me, let me that. that. Let me address that, Mr. White. Thank you, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing us to be here and, and take your time and to speak. Uh, as uh, Superintendent White uh, said in January when we were here, there, there was a, a glitch uh, in, or February, was it February? January. January. There was a glitch in the, in the uh, data. Uh, I, other than worrying with all those technological details, uh, just the, the information was there, then it was not there, and if you know anything about technology, you can appreciate that. Uh, we have since then place the data back in, into our school information system and download it to the state and all that appropriate data is there. The uh, lack of, if we should say, of uh, minority uh, participation at Delta Charter School uh, has a rhyme and has a reason and, and we've asked Mr. Collins to come today to speak to that, to, to give you that understanding that, that I think you very much, being confused not from the community, would wonder why only 15% minority at Delta Charter School when roughly it is 50-50. Uh, so, Mr. Collins, would you? I'm Stephen Collins. I'm a math teacher currently here at Delta Charter. I've taught at Concordia Parish, which is the parish where we have Vidalia and Faraday, and I've taught in Catahoula Parish, which also has some kids at Delta Charter. Um, I went out talking to the parents, recruiting parents, white and black, and what I've found from the community is the problem is they're being told things like you have to have a 4.0 in order to go to Delta Charter. Or they only want the black kids over there so they can get some numbers and then they're going to start their little private white school. They're going to get you over there and then they're going to put you away from there for some reason. And then they're going to start their own little private white school. And, and I'm, I'm there teaching. And had I, if I believed that, I wouldn't be there. I've taught in the parishes that are around this area. And uh, I can tell you that the kids there are getting a better, a better quality education than they would have gotten had they been in their home districts, wherever they came from. I've taught in Concordia and in Faraday at the high school, and I've taught in Catahoula at Block High School. <laughs> taught math in most places, and I'm teaching math now, and I know that the kids <laughs> are getting a better education because we're getting more time teaching than we would at those schools. We, don't have, we have less distractions. The kids are more motivated. The parents are more concerned. Um, I think the reason that we do have this low number of minorities is because the minorities are listening to what they're being told by the other parishes, that the kids are just being brought over for the numbers. Once we get your kids there, then we're going to put them out. And that, that hadn't been the case. I don't know if any kids have been put out because uh, of anything. I would add that that on August the 12th of uh, 2013, when Delta Charter School opened, we did not have a black application remaining. Every African-American student that applied to Delta Charter School had a seat in the school. So we in no wise did we reject any uh, African-Americans for, for, for any reason. And the... Uh, the fact that this disinformation campaign has gone on in, in, the, in the area of Delta Charter School and the surrounding parishes is, is uh, I think it speaks very clearly uh, to, to why our numbers are down. I think the fact that we, we have over 30 percent of the applicants for next year are African Americans speaks to the fact that the disinformation that was given is not true. 
and that the people in the community are beginning to see that Delta Charter School is a school that services all children. We're there for the kids. We're not there for the adults. We're there for the children. And that we give every child that comes through there an opportunity for a quality education. I'm reminded of President Obama recently as he submitted his education bill for 2015. He made the comment, he said, our budget is about choices. It's about our values. And so Delta Charter School being here this, this afternoon, uh, having the opportunity to address this assembly, that, that's what I would like to say. It, it, it's about our choices. It's about giving folks choices. And it's about our values. And when I say our values, uh, Mr. White, I'm, I'm speaking for, for you and for, for this board. Our values are that children in this state receive a quality education. And that's what we want to make sure that we can provide for them. Now, much ado about data. I've been in education a long time, and it's, it's a dirty word uh, because we live and die by data. Yes, I would agree, and I agreed with Mr. Walsh when I spoke with him that when it comes to LEAP scores, I-LEAP scores, and ACT scores, I have nothing to lay on the table to give you. But what I do have is a failed school system, the, uh, the, the systems that surround Delta Charter School, and, and we have uh, a stack of applications there. It, it, it's a little, uh, Madam also has already said that th this this is this is about uh, this is simply about. It's not about choices, I suppose. It's not about uh, whatever. Yes, it is. This is about giving kids a chance to have an education that they otherwise would not be able to have. Thank you. Mr. Gary. Yes. Ma'am, Ms. Moranti. Um, I'm really hoping that you understand the position that we're in right now, that we have a very rigorous protocol with regard to what we have to do to those, make those amendments or, or to make those changes. And I would, I would say that everything sounds wonderful. But until we can see it go through the proper protocol and then come to us for approval, it's not going to happen. And I, I would urge you to please get exactly what you need in place so that when it's put on the agenda and it comes to us for approval, that you pass with flying colors. That's what I would pray. I think just for clarity here, and I have had extensive discussions uh, with the school and with the superintendent, and I think, does the superintendent have a card? I mean, Yes, so, he does. So we'd like to hear from that is, uh, just to the defense of the process, they did come with their application. Uh, they did come with the protocol, and it, came, it was on the agenda at one point for the last meeting. It was taken off because uh, upon the review, the department uh, at the it, it just so happened the timing of it, it, the agenda was published, they discovered there were some inconsistencies in the data, and so in good conscience, the department felt like they needed to pull that. Well, maybe that's the process. Well, I think we're, we're sitting on their application. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's, been a, it's been a, you know, as I said, I, I trust every word y'all said. It's just a difficult thing to try to dig under the hood of because it gets so much to the to the heart of the community. I mean, what what you're basically saying is that policies that represent values that we hold dear, which is we serve the disadvantaged first, you have had a harder time of implementing because of conditions that no one up here will ever really be privy to. And you know, I don't know what the superintendent's going to say, but that's what makes this so so difficult. It's hard to say that we should be able to break the contract and, and not break the contract, amend the contract and, and enroll more kids, which we typically do because of parent choice when, you know, if we're going to come back next year and see that, just to put it bluntly, from my perspective, in terms of my recommending this to the board, that the percentage of kids who are white in the school is still wildly inconsistent with the percentage of kids who are white, not just in the district, but in the town in which the school resides. Can, can I say, if we, if we can only add 15 students next year, it doesn't take uh, my third grade math, my third grade girl could figure this out. Those numbers are not going to move when you give us 15 students. I mean, we're literally getting 1.5 student to add to our class. But you're enrolling new grade levels next year, too. Well, well right. we're enrolling, we're moving up one. We've right. got the kindergarten, which, which will have a full kindergarten configuration. 
and 15 additional students to, to service the first through 10th grade, which we'll have by, by our contract. Uh, when we, when we signed our Bessie contract, the Department of Education, we went to 275 children. And if you use the, the 20% or, or multiply it times the 120, which you can do, it comes up to like 330 possible children. And the way the second year read in the contract, we wasn't able to, or we didn't get that part amended when we went to the 275. This is when Parker Baxter was here, and he was the liaison with us with this. And that's why the first year's contract shows like 275 children. And the second year contract literally shows the one that we had submitted like two years ago, which is a, a number not much greater than 275. Like I said, it only allows for 30, 36 new kindergarten children and 15 throughout. And granted, that's, that's part of our fault, uh, obviously. So it, it's, there, there's a lot of things that, that happened here. Uh, originally, that first year, we, weren't, we wasn't going to have as many children as we ended up getting. And the contract that we did sign with y'all was for the 275 for the initial year. But the original submission was for like 230 kids. So I don't know if you can see where I'm going with this, but when we got the 45 additional kids for the first year, we didn't increase that second year by that denomination. We didn't factor that in. Somehow we, we missed that. And that, you know, I take full responsibility for it. We had a lot going on. and. That, that's why it's so, the numbers are so bad. Why would we get 330 and then the next year only have a kindergarten and 15 extra students? So, How many know, students do you have now? Uh, we actually have uh, three, like 325. Mr. Chairman, I don't, first of all, Mr. Lee, I don't, I got a little concern that we're even discussing it. But secondly, I don't understand what they're asking for. And they're asking thirdly, that, I, I <clears throat> hope that we'll hear from the superintendent mm -hmm. they're, they're asking to adjust their contract to add an additional grade level that otherwise they wouldn't be able to add of 15 students okay but mr chairman is it is it true, though, that there'd be nothing we could do anyway even though if that's the ask like given that the protocol mm -hmm. is not in place like is there any action the board can take anyway today or are we just literally listening we are listening Mr. White, if I, if I could. You know what I, I would suggest? I, I, my sense is that the board seems like, feels like it's heard all that it can hear yep. on this issue. If they're, I don't mean to, to, to manage the board, the process, but my, my sense is probably the facts are on the table. I, don't know. I have one more uh, question, if I may. Ms. Gia. Uh, and maybe you covered this before. I was a few minutes late. The value added scores will be out in April? The, the test scores. The test scores for the school, right? Uh, May. Yes. In May, okay. Mr. Oh, Ms. Ms. Smith. Just for background information, what grade levels do you have right now? Kindergarten through ninth grade. And you are approved for kindergarten through tenth? For next year, yes, For next year. Yes, ma'am. We have a lot of classes that, say, have uh, their split classes with 15 kids in each class, for instance. We, we wanted to be able to fill that class up to, like, 20 per section as opposed to 15. Uh, obviously for financial reasons, but mainly because people want to be there. But, but in reality, you're already approved for 10th grade, which you don't have now. Right. So what are you asking for? We're asking for, instead of just going to the 10th grade next year, we wanted to be able to go to the 11th grade yes. as well. Plus additional students. In Plus the, the additional students in the throughout the other grades. Uh, like I said, we have a lot of open seats throughout the grades. Uh, the math comes out to we're roughly at about 30 students per grade. Some classes have 38. Some classes might only have 26 kids in it. You know, there's a lot of fluctuation. Uh, but we have a lot of available seats, and uh, we, we would like to put children in them. Let but me, but we me. couldn't fill them up this year because we were restrained to that number, which we respected. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lee. If I may get clarity, you're asking for to add an additional grade above what you're presently authorized for. That yes, would sir. be eleventh grade. Yes, and sir. secondly, you're asking to increase the authorized number from two seventy five to what? Um I think if we could go from two seventy five to three fifty or three seventy five, 
that would probably, you know, when you use, you do get to use the, the 120 percent multiplying factor, which gives. But you those some, are the two things you're asking. Yes, for. sir. Uh, that would accommodate the, yeah, uh, uh, a lot more of our students. As Mr. White has said, we have got a good sense for this side. Let's hear from the superintendent, uh, unless there's any objections from the Bessie members. Um, let's have Mr. Nelson come down. Um, well, I guess Superintendent White, does the policy Ms. Hill? does the policy state, which I haven't, I have to go back and look at it, but can we, because I know this is their first year, so, I mean, what records do we have to show academic success or financial success, um, leadership success, to say, hey, we're going to extend this charter? So does the policy allow us to ignore that and say, hey, we're going to extend this charter beyond the contract and ex the expand policy, the The policy is just a contract with this board. This board can adjust the contract as with any contract. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, Mr. Nelson, and, and before you go, I'd like to read a note that I had in my pocket which says to call Paul Nelson with Concordia Parish. And I apologize for not getting to do that yesterday. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me just start out uh, by saying uh, a couple general comments and then I'll talk a little bit more uh, specifically about this. First of all, Concordia Parish School System uh, has 11 schools and we are a C-rated district and we have a 77% free and reduced lunch count in our parish. If you look at your numbers statewide, you'll find there's only four districts statewide that have a percentage of free and reduced lunch at 75% or higher that are a C. We were one of Angeline, uh, Washington, and Red River. So to say that this district is failing is absolutely not true. Mr. Jackson refers to some of the schools in Ferry, yet the Delta Charter School is supposed to be representative of the parish. And the parish is 50-50 white. And according to our desegregation order, Delta Charter School should be 60-40 uh, white. But if you look geographically in our parish, Mr. White is absolutely correct. Uh, the, the Monterey community, if you took a census report, would be 95% white. Those school, the school there, which is a K-12 unit school, it's 98% white. If you came to Vidalia, you'd find in the census report that the town's approximately 70-30, and you'll find that the schools are approximately 70-30. If you go to Faraday, you'll find that in the city limits of Faraday, the city's probably somewhere around 80% black, and the schools are 95-plus percent black in that community. And when you throw all those numbers together, you'll find that the district, which is about 3,600 students, is going to be roughly 50-50. Now. We talked a lot about black and white, but if you refer to, to your own policy dealing with charter schools in section 2713, uh, dealing with at-risk students, which doesn't define black or white, but just at risk, it says that charter schools created as new schools shall maintain an at-risk student population based on the October 1 pupil membership count that is equal to the percentage of students eligible for the federal free or reduced lunch program in the district in which the charter school is located, or the average of districts from which students served by the charter school reside. Now, Tensile Parish, which is one of our bordering parishes, free and reduced lunch counts greater than mine. I'm not sure what Dr. Freeman's is in Catahoula, but I know that mine is 77%. I have reason to believe that the students at Delta Charter School, regardless of color, did not meet this requirement right here. Based on that and the fact that we have no test data to verify that the school is in fact successful, I ask that Bessie do not grant or does not grant them an extension or a modification to their current charter agreement. Okay. Do the Bessie members have any other questions? And I don't guess I can respond, huh? My, See as if you can keep it sir? short. As a charter advocate, the, the thing that's always intrigued me about this process dealing with our local school board is why do they really care what we're trying to do? Now, we're, we know we have to get these numbers. We, we are working on these numbers. We have a lot of people who had not even filled out their free and reduced lunch. You can't make them by law do it, but, God, we're trying. But at the end of the day, we're, we're concentrating on our school, and they really spend a lot of time concentrating on – bad misinformation, telling teachers things that aren't true, and, and in general really worrying about us. And 
my thing is, I'm glad they got a magnet school. They got a magnet school because we were pushing for this. I've got the emails to prove it. I'm proud of that. That's a good thing for our school parents. That's another choice. My thing is, is we ought to all want choice. I, I know he has a business to run and he wants the money, but if, if a kid wants to leave his school, if a kid wants to leave Delta Charter and go back to Vidalia, I promise you, I'm not going to call that kid and try to talk him out of it. I'm like, hey, man, that's what it's about. It's about choice. That's what it's about for me. So when, when somebody comes and, and advocates against us and against what children and parents want, it just kind of sticks in my crawl a little. I'm just being honest. So let, let me just maybe if I could summarize. It's up to our department to bring you a recommendation on this question. Um, here, here's what we have. I, I agree with you, Mr. Jackson, in terms of philosophy, 100 percent. I'm right with you. I don't think they have should be in the business, and I don't think you should be in the business, right. of telling a family where they should go to school. That's their choice. On the other hand, all of that uh, presumes that the people who are providing the service are good actors. And I know you all are trying, and I know you're trying. But it's we have laws, and we need the laws to be followed. And so it's not a question for me of, of you know, just superintendent, so you're clear about denying choice. We don't want to deny choice. But I want to make sure when we send someone somewhere, they're comporting with the law. Yes. If we're giving you all permission to do something different than what we originally agreed to, I think it's our, it's, it's our obligation to make sure that you're actually doing what you agreed to do in the first place. Yes, sir. So I, I wanted to, to, and I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, you indulging us in this. I wanted you all to come and be able to present this publicly. Board members, I want you to know that we will bring you a recommendation based on what has been shared today on the record. I hope you all trust that whatever we bring will be based on the open dialogue that's had here today, and we can put the, all of the back and forth and the email campaign behind us, if that's okay with the board. Okay. That sounds, that sounds good. So we will do that for the next, for the next meeting. Thank you all Thank for your you. time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Can Appreciate we have you coming. Jard, Wyatt, Wyatt? Come speak, please. Uh, now, now, members, this regards the one recommendation that we do have for today. Uh, we have a uh, Type 5 charter school in Caddo Parish that is applying for a uh, grade reconfiguration. They are applying on the basis, uh, they are a, currently a middle school. They have uh, demonstrated significant improvement. I know they're nowhere near where they want to be, but they've demonstrated real improvement. And they're a volunteer, they are uh, uh, applying to start at the kindergarten level. The department is proposing to recommend and endorse their application, uh, not just because of the improvement that they have shown recently, but also because of the lack of uh, uh, high performing options that are in the neighborhood of the children uh, available to the school. So I thank you all for coming and I know they're on the comment list, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Lee. Can I make a comment? I've known these folks, some of them, for a long time. Uh, Mr. White is a former school board member, been very active uh, in education for a long time, uh, and is sincerely concerned about at-risk children. This is a school that's primarily minority. Uh, it will be. Uh, so it's not a racial matter with them. I think they are making a difference. Uh, I think we're seeing some good things happen there. Uh, Mr. Barr is a military man and a former employee with the school system. Uh, quality educator that can that cares about children. And I, I know they'll get into their presentation and what they're asking for, but I would want the board to know I do support their effort and their interest in trying to help the children that are going to be coming there anyway. They just want to give those children a opportunity to get better experiences before they get to their school. Okay, Mr. Wyatt. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, we are, uh, I'm the president of Shreveport Charter Schools, Inc., which operates Linwood Public Charter School. It's, we're in our fifth year. Uh, we're a type five, we're a takeover school, uh, a school that failed for many, many years uh, before we took it over. And we have made some progress and got out of that failing category, not nearly where we want to be yet. But the, uh, and, and let me tell you who I have with me today. I have Mrs. Vicki Carroll, who is our school director. She's the principal uh, with a long background in, in primary education. Uh, 
and Ms. Paula Franklin, who is the president of our uh, Parent Connection. She has a child in the school and is very active in, in bringing parents into the process. And Mr. David Barr, who is our vice president of our board, uh, retired Army uh, colonel, uh, also retired from Cattle Parish Schools, and also from the Caddo Parish Sheriff's Department. You think about some experience that's appropriate. <laughs> uh, and so um, our operator is uh, Savas Educational Systems, which has been operating schools on five continents, 15 countries. They have 75 schools. It's a 127-year-old company. All of their schools are taught in English, no matter where they're located. And uh, they have a, a world of experience that, uh, that we are making good use of. Our school is 95% uh, for in reduced lunch. It's in, a, it's in an area of Shreveport called Cedar Grove, which was once a community of its own, but is now incorporated into the city. Uh, it's a high crime, low income area that needs a lot of help. And we took Linwood because we thought that was a place where we could really make a difference, and we are making a difference. Now, saying that, I have to say that our students, when we started, I mean, we're in our fifth year, when we started, they were coming to us, the sixth graders were coming to us reading at a fourth grade level. It has regressed. Every year, they've been coming to us with a little lower level of reading skills. Now we're down to third grade, 3.2 what was our, our this year our sixth graders came to us reading 3.2 we have been trying to address how can we how can we overcome that obstacle we only keep them for three years and we try to catch up six years in three well it was suggested to us that what we should do is to start with the lower grades and build our own k-8 we have six seventh and eighth now we are applying for an amendment to our charter to add kindergarten and first grade next year, and then the subsequent year, second grade, <coughs> then the third grade in the following year, fourth and then fifth, so we'll grow our own K-8. Um, we've consulted with Caddo. I've personally visited with their new superintendent, told him of our plan. He called that afternoon and set up a meeting, came and brought his top people to visit the next day, uh, looked at the facilities. We are collaborating with them about how to, how to modify the current facility to handle <laughs> kindergarten and first grade next year, and then work together on coming up with a plan to build a new, a new facility on that property, which has lots of room, uh, that will then subsequently handle the second, third, fourth, and fifth grades in succeeding years. Um, our attorneys are working on an agreement about who would own what if something changed in our charter. And so we are here today to talk to you about uh, making that amendment and approving that amendment so that we can start next year with kindergarten and first grade. Okay. We'd be happy to answer any questions, especially my colleagues. Yes, ma'am. Um, let's talk over on the side, Ms. Smith. Just, just a comment. I think one of the first calls I got when, when I was appointed to the board was, was from, from you, Garth, and I appreciated it. And I, I got a chance to visit and uh, spend some time walking up and down the halls, visiting classes. And I got to tell you, I was extremely impressed. Um, and what what you're saying today is, is absolutely what I witnessed and so uh, I applaud you for the efforts I know that it, it has been tough I know that you've you've taken on quite a challenge but I saw a visible difference and and I was extremely impressed with the facility and with the teachers and what was going on in the classrooms and by the way it was the day after Halloween thank you so very much. I, it could have been real disruptive but it was it was it was a pleasure to be there thank, thank you. you okay Miss Bothy the, uh, I had a question about, you said the reading level was a 3.2. Is yeah. that the average reading level? Or are we talking really? Yes, uh, that's the STAR test. When, you know, when, when they come in, we test every student to see exactly where they are so that we know where to place them to get the best results. And, yeah, they're reading on the average 3.2. What are they exiting your school with? Better than that, but not where we'd like them to be. 
to be honest. Not not yet where we'd like them to be. We aren't getting them all the way up to the eighth grade, but they're coming. You know, they're 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 gaining more than the years they spend with us, and it's a good question. And we've done a lot of study on that. And the ones who have stayed with us three years are scoring 20 points higher in their achievement tests than those who only come with us one year. So it's it, it, it we, we're proving that it makes a difference. And what we'd like to do now is to start earlier, start earlier, and have them have them longer. Okay, Ms. Beebe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barbie. Uh, Mr. Wyatt. Wait. Uh -huh. Wait. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, you mentioned, or I see a copy of our supporting documents. There's a, a there's correspondence, uh, or actually minutes of a meeting, and you you alluded to it in your presentation about the concern for facilities. You said you had a conversation with the local superintendent. Yes, ma'am. So how how are you going to resolve that issue? Okay, we're going to use the present facility, which has had as many as 750 students in it. Uh, it will handle next year's capacity. Might even handle the following year, but not fully. Uh, but we're going to we're planning to build another facility, an additional facility on that property to accommodate the future growth. And you also, in the supporting documentation, there were comments made that uh, the the rationale is to some extent due to the reconfiguration plan of Caddo Parish. That's where a part of it, yes, ma'am. There so, are. So it's mentioned that K to five schools will become four to six schools. So what happens to the the uh, pre K to, to three students? In well, the, the, the school, the uh, Caddo Parish school system is is restructuring a number of their schools to be K threes and 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 then others to be four to eight and and so the students are going to be broken up uh, where they were K five before. They'll be in two different schools. And that's happening in some of the schools that are immediately around us. So that's another reason why the, we think the demand is there for this. But our our real purpose, the driving force uh, for us making this request, is that we want to start with the students sooner. We like to start from the very beginning and, and bring them into school uh, under our supervision so that by the time they get to the sixth grade, they'll be reading at maybe the seventh grade level. Well, I do applaud you for your focus, and, and as you mentioned, your student population, the fact that it, you have 95% free and reduced lunch, and you're not about cherry picking. That's right. So, we, um, that's right. We have no entrance requirements. Mr. Chairman, I, Mr. I've, got, I've got a question now. If you're next year, you're wanting to add K-1. Yes. Uh, second grade, second through fifth grade, they're going to have to go back to the public school system? Where they, wherever they are now, yes, yes. See, that's a but little bit. We want to take the second grade the following year after that, the third grade the following year after that. See, that's a that's a little bit strange to me. Uh, looks like once you get them on campus and start them early, you'd want to keep them. You're, you're not kicking. You're not oh, kicking. Oh, you're not. Oh, no, but, but guard, no, you're not we're, kicking we're kids out. We're talking about keeping the kindergarten yeah. first graders when they oh, become okay. second graders. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm just saying we wouldn't we wouldn't have second graders next I year. You, I thought you were going to put them out. No, sir. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I misunderstood your question. Sorry about that. Well, they can fend for themselves. I mean, they're six years old. I, mean, yeah. I would. Uh, I would like to comment too that. Uh, Mr. Waite took this school under some very adverse conditions. It, it was a hostile takeover. <laughs> yeah, it sure was. Uh, Not on our part, but it was, yes. Uh, and I had some concern about it. <laughs> Still have some question about whether it should have happened or not, but it did. Uh, but I think they've come a long way, and they're, they're doing a quality job. Okay. Do we have Thank any other you. questions from Bessie members? Uh, hearing none, do we have a motion on the table? We do. Okay. Do we have any objections to the motion? <coughs> hearing none, the motion carries. Next item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next item is item 3.1. That's on page 8. Consideration of revisions to Bulletin 126, Charter Schools, regarding Charter School Renewal and Extension, Evaluation of Alternative Charter Schools, and Streamlining of Policies. The Department recommendation is to approve as a Notice of Intent. Okay, do we have a, a so moved. motion? So moved. Second. Ms. Bovey and uh, Ms. Jones seconded. Um, 
May I comment? Yes. Thank you. Superintendent. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, um, as you know, we, we talk a lot about raising the bar, and it is really important that all processes for accountability and, uh, and such uh, be participants in that process. And uh, today we bring you a proposal to raise the bar for the renewal process for charter schools. And uh, I, first of all, Louisiana wins a lot of uh, plaudits from around the country for its, the rigidity and the stringent nature of its charter authorizing practices. But I have to say, uh, it, is, it is true that today you basically can maintain your authorization if you are not an F-rated school. And uh, because we've been blessed with extraordinary educators, some of which are sitting in this room today, um, <clears throat> in New Orleans and across the state, we really are now in a position to say it is time to do better than just accountable for not failing. And it's time to systemically raise the bar on charter school renewal. Now, we know that our charter schools, especially our, take, our type five charter schools, take on the hardest to serve challenges, hardest to serve kids, the biggest challenges. And we don't want to create a situation where we just automatically assume every turnaround is going to be an A immediately. We still know it takes time. But we can't uh, accept that schools that are in existence for many years continue to persist, even at a D level. We need to raise that bar. And so what we are proposing to do today is to bring you policy that allows us to transition to higher standards for charter schools. This is not about a letter grades, not about accountability. It's about when charter schools are renewed to continue their contracts for future years and the standards that we use. We are proposing three sets of schools. Turnaround schools. Secondly, non-turnaround charter schools. And three, alternative charter schools, schools that exist simply to take students who have been expelled from other settings. So again, turnaround schools, these are schools that take over the entire population of a school that historically was failing, such as the one we just, we just mentioned. Two, non-turnaround schools, such as the one previous to that, Delta. Schools that started from scratch. Or three, alternative schools, schools that exist solely to serve students who have been expelled from the traditional environment. What we are proposing to you is that initially, uh, we maintain the idea that schools must be at a D letter grade or higher. For 2014, that will be the continued renewal standard. However, in 2015, we will shift to schools having to be a letter grade of D or higher to receive an extension unless they are a turnaround school and have shown significant growth. However, schools must be a C or higher if this is not the first time they've come up for renewal. Now remember, most of our charters are post-Katrina type 5 New Orleans schools. We're now getting into not the first generation, we're completing the second generation of them coming to you asking for the continued ability to operate. Soon they will come to you for the third time asking for the ability to operate. And what we are suggesting is that such schools must be a letter grade of C or higher to receive subsequent renewals, or they must be a turnaround school that has shown dramatic growth. This is a fundamental shift. It's a sea change. In my discussions with charter school leaders, it is a scary uh, uh, proposition, but they also see it as a great opportunity to define a minimum standard of quality that is well beyond simply not failing. We're getting beyond that in our approach. For alternative charter schools, uh, there, this is a small number of charter schools that exist around the state, primarily in New Orleans. They exist to serve the students who have been expelled from other settings. These are our most challenged students. Uh, there are several such schools. Obviously, they, see, they serve a unique population. We are proposing that these schools, A, must serve a non-traditional population. That must be explicit in their charter. That they must elect to be evaluated on an alternate framework. And that they must receive Bessie explicitly as approval, uh, excuse me, approved as an alternative school. This framework uh, will allow school to receive points for hitting specific performance targets as well as number of points to qualify for extension and renew renewal. And in the future, 
Uh, with BESI approval, the department may establish additional evaluation frameworks for alternative charter schools with other specific populations and missions. And we're happy to talk with you about the specifics, but these schools, just so you know, are the Net Charter High School, Jefferson Chamber Foundation Academy, which is in Kenner, Crescent Leadership Academy, and the Renew Accelerated High Schools. Also, the Max Charter School may use uh, a different framework in the future, although we're not proposing that, that today. I'm happy to talk about the specifics of these three proposals or have our staff come down and do it. But before we do that, I also want to thank uh, Adam Hoff and the entire portfolio team. They've done a fantastic job, as well as Bridget Devlin and Aaron Bendeley, who've been involved in this process from the start. And I really want to thank the charter operators that helped us in designing this policy. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Happy to talk through specifics with okay, the board. Uh, well, we'd like to hear from the speakers first before we go to questions. Okay, can we have Ben Claven come down, uh, Ms. Millie Harris, and Colonel Bill Davis, please. Just for clarification, this would be a notice of intent? This policy would be going out on notice of intent, yep. <clears throat> Okay, Ms. Harris. Thank you so much. First of all, I'm Millie Harris from Jefferson Chamber Foundation Academy. JCFA was approved by you all as a type two charter school in December of 2012. But in August of 2010, we opened our first school in Jefferson Parish as a type one alternative charter high school. The average student at JCFA is an 18 year old sophomore reading at an eighth grade level and doing math on a sixth grade level. Yet in four years, or just under four years, we've graduated 105 students, 37% of which have matriculated to post-secondary education, including to institutions like LSU and Nichols. We're very proud of the work that we do. Yet every year, we receive an F for accountability. And I recognize that this is not about accountability, but this is about renewal. But I do think that this is the first step, hopefully, that you all will take in designing an accountability matrix to truly assess the student growth of our student population. Mm -hmm. Our students come in, 57% of them, two or more years behind their cohort. When 50% of accountability is based on who graduates with their cohort, you can imagine the struggle that a school like ours would have to get these kids who are 18-year-old sophomores to graduate in May of that year. Mm -hmm. This opportunity to have an assessment matrix for renewal will help ensure that organizations like JCFA, Renew, the NET, and other charter organizers can still serve students who truly need individualized education and caring adults to provide those services. I'm very proud to say that we had a graduation on the 25th of February with 23 participants including a young lady who came to us as a 17-year-old freshman with an infant son. She graduated two and a half years later after being enrolled with us. Her little boy is enrolled in pre-K three and has a great outlook on education because of her experience with our institution. We also had a young lady who was the first time graduate of high school in her family. The investment that we make in these students creates a direct impact on the communities that we serve. And allowing us to be assessed in a positive way gives us the opportunity to continue to serve students who are not a good fit in the traditional system. Mm -hmm. So we are truly happy to have worked with Patrick and the team, and we really hope that you all will take this into consideration and vote favorably for it. Thank you. Um, excuse okay. me, Chair. Ms. Hill? I just want to. I'm sorry, what's your name? My name is Millie Harris. Okay, Ms. Harris. I think you articulated very well in regards to some of your challenges that you guys are facing as an alternative school. And I think the point that you made, not only are the charter schools are struggling in that matter, the traditional public schools are struggling in that matter as well. This is what I do for a living. I work with that population. So with that being said, 
And I know with this policy, not only will we look at the letter grade, because like you said, even though you guys have been an F, but growth-wise, you guys have made the growth. And I hope that the board would take this in consideration, but not only look at the policy for charter, we'll look at the policy for traditional public school and the voucher, um, the scholarship program as well, because our kids are behind. And each person want to blame whatever system, but it's not a blaming game. We have to make sure that our children receive the quality of education that they deserve. And so by you articulating that, that really touched me because not only are you guys challenged with that in the charter system, the non, I mean the traditional system is challenged with the same thing. So I hope Superintendent White, when we do for the charter in regards to looking at their growth, we need to do the same thing for the traditional setting as well. Let me, uh, first of all, just I, I couldn't agree more with you. I think it's very important. Um, I do want to raise, there's a couple of distinctions here. First of all, this is not about letter grades. This is about renewal of charters. I know we're all clear on that. Second of all, one of the things that makes this hard is with the difference between districts and charters is that districts don't have to run alternative schools. They can run alternative programs. And when they do that, the accountability remains with the sending high school. Charters are their own individual entity. So their, their accountability is their accountability. There is no sending school for the, in that instance. And third, the federal government requires that the letter grade formula be the same for every single school in the state. So we're in a bit of a, this is a difficult problem, and, and we haven't really figured, figured out a way to fix it. When a district says, no, I must operate a school, not a program, and we say to them, well, if you do that, the federal government is making us give it the same accountability letter grade formula as every other school. You don't have to do a school. So it creates some challenges. But I, I look forward to working with you on how we could solve that. But for, the, for today's purposes of renewal, I think your, your concept is right on the money. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Ms. Clavin? Thank you. Um, I'm Ben Cleveland. I'm the CEO of New Orleans College Prep. We operate three Type 5 charter schools in New Orleans, uh, and we've been operating for seven years. Um, I just wanted to express my support of the new frameworks for accountability. Uh, the charter law grants us uh, a great level of autonomy to operate our schools and achieve the outcomes in the manner that we uh, know in the strategies and manners that we know we need to to get those outcomes and it keeps decision making at the school level. Um, but in return for that autonomy, we uh, we want to be accountable, and we want to be part of a growing community of charter schools that are raising the bar for achievement for our kids. And so we uh, embrace these new standards and um, appreciate the RSD for uh, the iterations of feedback that they've uh, considered from us to make sure that this policy really meets the realities of what we're dealing with on the ground. So thank you, and I, and I support the policy. Thank you. Colonel Davis? Sir, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time and efforts. Uh, again, New Orleans Military Maritime Academy. I'm Colonel Bill Davis, the Commandant, Acting Superintendent, CEO, whatever you want to say. Uh, teamed up with Dr. Cecilia Garcia, the principal. And uh, uh, you all set us up a couple of years ago. We started in 11. And I think that the uh, compact that we dealt with back in 2011 was a great start. It was very holistic. And it led us to where we are today. It's improved accountability. In the Marine Corps, we have a saying, you expect what you inspect. And when they come by every year and we go through that holistic checklist, you know that you're being looked at from a variety of frameworks. Uh, it gave better guidance to the schools and a better method for evaluation of how we were doing across the board to support the education of young men and women that come to the academy. But that renewal process is now the next step that's an outcome of this. And we see that as using the same well-defined well -defined metrics and the measured results that come from that to increase performance expectations across the board, as it should be. We shouldn't settle for mediocrity. We shouldn't settle for the same standard year after year. We should be expecting process improvement and performance improvement from the schools. If not, we stagnate and die. And all these children's lives are put at risk. And people forget, as we run a high school, <clears throat> I have to remind a lot of people that high school is that step off point to life. Um, it's very important, not only from a social standpoint and development standpoint, but this is where you determine your trajectory in life. And that's why we feel it's so important and why we think that this renewal process, by forcing a higher standard going forward, uh, will effectively produce those better outcomes in the future as people realize that you do need to improve, you do need to work harder, you need to push your program to the best you can. <clears throat> but it also does provide consideration for the more challenging programs. I appreciate that offering, too, because they're doing a lot of, well, 
the Lord's work or whatever you want to say. And uh, that's really helpful to them to be able to get rewarded or supported for their programs as well. So the last comment I'd say then is we're ready to implement, comply, and we look forward to seeing you sometime this fall into the winter as we come up for our renewal. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have four more speakers. Elizabeth Osterberg, Michelle Brown, Kate Mehawk, and Maggie Sheppa? Shep Sheppa. Okay, if we could start on the left and work our way down and start with your name, please. And uh, Certainly. Uh, my name is Michelle Brown. I'm on the board of the Net Charter High School. Um, and I'm here with Ms. Osberg, who's our principal. Um, and we're here to voice our support for the, um, the framework for the renewal of the charters for the alternative charter schools. But anyway. Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Osberg. I'm the principal of the Net Charter High School. <coughs> We are an alternative school in New Orleans. We serve 150 students. Um, and in the year and a half that we've been open, we've graduated 42 students. These are students who um, were expelled from other schools, dropped out of other schools, um, or for a variety of reasons were struggling very seriously academically or behaviorally in other schools. Um, according to their families, their former uh, principals and to themselves, um, they have voiced that they would not have graduated if they did not have the supports that our school was able to provide. Um, what we appreciate about this renewal framework is that it really holds us to the promise that we made uh, when we wrote the charter, which is that we will seek out the students who are most seriously struggling. We will get them back into school um, and keep them in school, which is part of the student sustainability rate. We will help them obtain their credits and the, the tests that they need in order to graduate. And so this framework um, holds us to the promises that we make, and that's what we appreciate. Okay, yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Kate Mehawk, the CEO of Crescent City Schools. We run three Type 5 charter schools in New Orleans, including two turnarounds. Um, I support everything that my colleagues have said here today, and I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, Superintendent White talked about how we're in the next generation of charters, and I think we've done a really great job in New Orleans taking most of our schools from out of failing. Um, but if we just stop there, then we haven't fulfilled the promise of the charter movement. And I, so I, I appreciate the framework in pushing us to consider the fact that we have to keep pushing ourselves to deliver better education for kids. And until we have a school that every kid goes to school in a place that all of us would want to send our own children, then we don't have what we, what we want. And so I, I actually have talked to the RSD. I think we could go even further than where we're going. And so I'm excited to see us make this change. I'd love to see more increase pushing us to not just be C schools eventually, but Bs and As in subsequent years. Um, but this is a good start, and, and, and I support it. Great. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Maggie Renyan Jaffa. I'm the Chief Schools Officer for New Schools for New Orleans. NSNO is a nonprofit in New Orleans that makes strategic investment of time, expertise, and funding to support the growth of high performing New Orleans charter schools. At NSNO, every decision we make is grounded in our mission, delivering on the promise of excellent public schools for every child in New Orleans. To achieve that mission, we have set a goal to help the city create 50,000 high-quality public school seats, one for every child <coughs> in the city. And at NSNO, we define high-quality as an A or B school on the state's accountability scale, or a school that is showing rapid academic growth. It is this belief that brings me here today to speak to you. NSNO fully supports the proposal to raise the standards for charter school renewals and extensions. While we must continue to do everything we can to support schools in becoming excellent and maximizing the number of children in great schools, we must also work to minimize the number of children languishing in low-performing schools. This strategy is working in New Orleans. In 2005, and between 2005 and 2013, the state published growth school performance scores using the same 0 to 200 scale. Over that period, the percent of New Orleans students in failing schools fell from 75% to 17%. 
this is significant. 25,000 children could still be in academically failing schools if this board had not empowered educators to open charter schools and then matched that autonomy with an increasingly high bar to continue to serve kids. Those same students are the ones now driving New Orleans' rising academic performance, students who now graduate at rates above state average, students with rising ACT scores, students receiving top scholarships, and students that are on pace to pass state proficiency averages. By approving this proposal, this body has an opportunity to once again decrease the number of students in low-performing schools. Charter schools helping their students to grow academically will thrive in this system, and more families will have high-quality options for their children. In closing, we consider it to be a great privilege to have the opportunity to educate the next generation of Louisiana citizens. That privilege should be held by the schools and networks delivering the highest quality educational experience for children. The policy before you today is an important step towards ensuring more students get an opportunity to attend a high quality Louisiana school, and they deserve nothing less. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have questions from board members? Ms. Hill. Um, Superintendent White, you um, expressed the significant growth in regards to when we look at the charter, um, instead of the letter grades, we look at their significant growth. Could you be more concrete? What would be significant growth? Two points, but I, three points, five points, but here within your um, language it says five point um, growth. I mean per five or more points growth. Five or, five or more per year. Yes, yeah, so if a school is F school and they have made a five or more point growth, you would recommend for us to extend that charter. Okay, with that being said, when I, I just, when I look at the traditional setting and even the scholarship program, even when you look at those schools that are in the same predicament as some of these charters that are maybe an F school or a D school, are we going to look at their numbers the same and say, well, hey, this school had a significant growth of 8.5 points, however, even though they are these school, let's look at the SPS schools. Are we going to, because my concern was, even when we looked at the park assessment, that was my point I was trying to make in regards to the letter grades, in regards to the SPS scores. Because just because the letter grade is there, that doesn't mean that the school is not succeeding or making sure that the kids have the quality of education that they deserve. So with that being said, are we going to make this across the board? for traditional and the scholarship program as well in regards to how we look at, for example, renewing the charters, for example, extending students for the scholarship program, example, um, including these um, scores within the district. Are we going to make that across the board? Are we going to look into that? Because that's my like concern. For, for what kind of decisions? Um, for example, with the charter, you're saying that for us to renew them, if they show a growth of five or more points, then you will recommend for us to renew them, okay? So my question is to make it a, a level playing field when we look at the scholarship program. If a school show five or more points, are you going to allow them to increase their enrollment? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Or for example, if we look at the traditional setting of a school that has been failing for a significant amount of time and they have made uh, 8.5 growth, would you give them additional point? That's, that's my point. I'm yeah. just trying to... Actually, I think, Adam, I think that's a very good, very good idea, and I'd like to consider it. So thank you for the scholarship schools. I think it's a very good idea. Adam, let, Adam let's make sure we make a note of that, okay? And even for the traditional setting, because we do have students that are being challenged with some of the same issues that the charter schools are being challenged with, the same, I mean, with the same students. So if a school is a F school, and they may be up maybe a AUS status, but they've made significant growth, will we still take over that school or will we say, hey, this school may be academic I mean may be deemed academically unacceptable, but however they have made a, a significant amount of growth, more than five or more points, let's reconsider not taking over that school. Could you follow what I'm saying? <laughs> I do, yeah, absolutely. We'll take a look at it. Yeah, I, I, I like both points. Okay. Okay, Ms. Jones. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say, as someone who's had the opportunity to really see the evolution of so many of the schools who will be impacted by um, this proposed policy over the past eight years, um, I continue to be inspired by the growth of our schools, by the commitment and the passion of our educators, by the um, 
the sheer potential of our students, which is what this is about. And, and I think just hearing the testimonies today, the fact that we have educators who are here um, and saying, we want you to raise the standard, hold us to a higher bar, um, demonstrating grit and perseverance and high expectations for yourselves as educators and by extension for our students and families and communities really, I think, presents such an important model for our kids. And so I just want to thank you for coming and sharing your perspectives uh, with us today. And I couldn't be in more support of what I think will be such an important policy in ensuring that we continue to raise the bar in New Orleans. Okay, Ms. Beebe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Garvey. I, I just have some reservations <coughs> about uh, the change, the proposed changes and the fact, I mean, Ms. Hill articulated it uh, well, so I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but then, you know, we have the same challenges within the traditional systems, and I know, uh, Superintendent White, you said this is not so much about accountability, but there is one of the bulleted items uh, does reference uh, accountability, and I just, uh, you know, I have the concerns that uh, the issues are prevalent in both systems so this is in my opinion creating uh, greater concerns about equity and then I also have to say and it's a nothing intended uh, certainly uh, I mean I, I appreciate ladies you coming forward uh, but yesterday I read an article uh, and it was written by an advocate in the Orleans Parish School System uh, and it was referencing the one app process and how, uh, I mean, the, the uh, author of the article uh, uh, indicated her concerns and that uh, children are suspended from school for uh, really insignificant uh, reasons uh, or one uh, or those, you know, maybe, for, uh, maybe not having the appropriate uniform and so, you know, when we, we have these groups who come and they testify to their success, and then we have the other group saying, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, they're, they're just uh, so upset with their, their situation in the, the one app process, with the one app process. I, I just, um, you know, I'm just, Torn, and then I, I can't. I mean, we can't lose sight of the fact that we have those challenges, the same challenges. And then, you know, I hear the success, the stories you tell, and I'm thinking, why aren't we at the table communicating uh, the strategies you use to make those kinds of growth? Instead of us being in competition, we need to be working together. And uh, it, you know, so. I mean, as I hear, as I listen to the presentation, I'm wowed by the success. But yet, you know, I would have to know more about your program, or your curriculum, whatever you're doing, because I think everybody wants positive student outcomes. You know, and I just feel this policy is going to further divide us, uh, traditional systems, charter systems. You know, here we, we're showing special consideration for uh, a unique population when we have that same population within our district. And I know you said uh, those of us with alternative programs, you know, you can't hold them uh, in the same uh, category. You can't compare them to uh, the, the uh, you can't compare the alternative programs to the alternative schools because the students in the alternative programs, they have other students in which to compare their their uh, performance on the mm -hmm. test. Mr. So. Chairman. Ms. Jones. I just wanted to follow up, Dr. Beebe, so that I better understand what you're saying. So when you say that a policy like this would better divide, you know, would, would potentially further divide schools, I, I want to know more. Is it be what about this, which is about raising the standard for renewal for certain charters who have, have been working to basically increase the student growth for, that, for the population of students they're working with? How would that further divide schools? Well, as I understand it, uh, as I listened, it appears that if uh, the child grows a, a certain number of points or, or 
you know, he maintains or attains a certain number of points. The school, the, the school will be, the, the charter license will be renewed as opposed to those in traditional systems as Ms. Hill uh, referenced. Uh, they may be in AUS and then they may be ready for takeover. Uh, takeover. So, I mean, we, but, you know, we have the same problems. Well, I think, so just, uh, I agree with that and I agree with those points entirely. And I also agree that accountability should try to parallel scholarship school, charter public school, traditional public school. I agree with both of what you both said entirely. I do think there are there's some difference in the charter schools, all of them come up for contracts on a four or five year basis, all of them. They are always in a question of whether or not they should exist. A very, very small number of district schools are under that AUS line. And I agree with you, actually. I think we should factor in growth to the AU, to the letter grade formula. That's why under our administration, we were the first ones that did it. And frankly, that's why a lot of those schools, uh, not so much Dr. Beebe in your district, but Ms. Hill in your district, got over that AUS line. In this parish, for example, last year, because we put growth into the letter grade formula. I actually think what would end up resolving all of these concerns is if the scholarship system the traditional public accountability letter grades and the charter public accountability letter grades included an adequate measure of growth in it. And I think that probably would, would take care of all of your concerns. The good news is the Accountability Commission is taking that up between March and August, and we're going to see if, if, we can, if we can develop an adequate system. But I look forward to those discussions because I agree with you. I think it's an important consideration. For now, this policy is really just about a condition unique to charter schools. They exist on a contract. District schools don't have that. So I, I propose we get through this, but then I also propose we take a, a more serious look than we have in the past at growth for all schools. I, I agree with you. It's the only fair thing. I, I have one more comment. To make, Ms. Jones. Mr. Chairman. Um, I just think um, I've been reflecting on the conversation. I just want to say that I think um, often it, our challenge as policy leaders is is to be able to at times separate the politics from the from the practitioner, which could get very conflated very quickly. And, and I think when I look at many of the educators across the city of New Orleans, many here, but many who aren't here, who, who are a part of this story, often the reason I'm most impressed by what I see is because as practitioners, they continue to, to challenge themselves, right? The politics swirl around them, and that will continue to be the case. Charter versus non, what are those issues? And, and that's our, we have to sort of take that on and, and figure out its appropriate place. But what I see in these educators as practitioners is they are actually standing there saying, raise the standard for us and we'll take responsibility. And I just want to commend you as a former teacher, as an educator, that I think at the end of the day, like that is such a critical component of what practitioners who are successful are able to do. And so while the politics swirl and the conversations and the debates continue, I just want to commend you for, for that mindset. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? We have a motion on the floor. Do we have any objections to the motion? I'm sorry, Ms. Beaver, did was that an objection? <laughs> Okay. Uh, hearing none, motion carries. Is that the last item? Last item. Okay. We adjourn.